Okay, you need a Bible, okay? And I don't mean on your phone. So underneath the chair, in front of you, there's a Bible. I'm serious. I'm going to be going and checking every row. You know how when you're on a plane, they come and check to make sure you got your seatbelt on? I'm going to be coming down. I have uh, stewardesses right here. I have a stewardess that's going to come. Or flight attendant. I'm sorry. That was insensitive of me. Flight attendant. No, seriously, you need a Bible and turn to the book of Numbers. So start at the very beginning. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and then Numbers. Okay, it's the fourth book in the Bible. So that's where we're going to be at today. We've been going through... um, Listen, I, I've got a lot to do today, uh, so I'm going to speak really fast, and you got to listen fast, uh, but we may get out of here late, all right? So, uh, um, st- you'll be all right. I hope you packed a lunch. Um, we got two chapters to go through today, so let me just tell you what's going on. So the, um, uh, the Exodus, we started at the beginning of last year, 2023. I started at the beginning of the Bible, and I said, we're going to go through the book of Genesis. So we did that. It took almost a whole year. And then we started going through the book of Exodus, and, uh, and so now we're, so we go, we have Exodus, and then we get into Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All those are connected in the Exodus. And so we're, today we're in Numbers chapter 13. And so what happened was in, the, the book of Exodus starts out, and it's, it's basically 400 years of slavery. The, the children of Israel had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. So God raises up a man, a deliverer, and his name was... Nobody's listening. Okay, <laughs> Moses. His name's Moses. And they talk about how he was a baby and he was, ended up in the palace. And when he was 40 years old, he killed a man and fled to the desert for 40 years. And then when he was 80 years old, God started using him. 80 years old. So let that be... Okay, be encouraged by that. Uh, so... I think it was, uh, who, who was it? Was it Colonel Sanders didn't discover the secret recipe until he was like 65 years old? So anyways, age doesn't matter. Anyways, uh, it's a score moment. But uh, so they, uh, the burning bush, he comes across the burning bush and it didn't burn up. So it freaked him out and God spoke to him and said, I got something for you to do. And so he went to, to his people and he went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh didn't want to. So there were 10 plagues, right? Ten plagues, and then after that, he let them leave, and then they got to the Red Sea, and God opened up the Red Sea, and they walked through on dry ground. Now they're in the the desert. Now here's you got to understand this for context. They're in Egypt, okay? They're in Egypt, and God says, "I've given you this promised land. This is your land. This is going to be your your very own land, and it's the land of Canaan." But between the land of Canaan and Egypt. Or it'd be, if you're looking at a map, like Egypt's here, the land of Canaan's here, is a desert, okay? So they had to cross the desert. And the other thing about that was that there were people there, okay? So you would be like, I, if I were there, I'd be like, why would you give me land where there's people there? And God's like, I'm glad you asked because it's your job to run them out. Your job is to get rid of the inhabitants there. And you might go, well, that seems weird or that that might seem cruel but those were evil people those people were sacrificing their children to their pagan gods so this god says this is your land but you got to get rid of them and i'll just give you just a little taste of what we're going to be talking about in a few weeks so the promised land was there and god's like this is your land you got to take it and they came in uh eventually and they defeated some of them and some of them got pushed out to the edges and the children of Israel goes, well, that's good enough, you know. And there were giants in the land and sometimes the people would run up into the mountains and the children of Israel were like, well, you know, we're, we're good. But then they would always come back down and fight with them and get them to worship their gods. And, and there's a spiritual application for everyone in this room. If you're a Christian, God says, get rid of it. The sin that's in your life, you need to just finally get rid of it. Don't just push it to the outer limits because it's going to come back. It's always going to plague you. We'll come back to that. Um, go, uh, put, the, put the map up. So this is the, this is the promised land up here, okay? Um, and so this is what we're going to look at today. This was their journey and, and so you just need to understand, when they came out of Egypt, I was trying to do some research for this. 
Um, everybody that I looked at, it, it looks like they've been in the desert for about, four, for about two years, okay? So that may seem like a lot because they were in the desert, and you remember every day they woke up, they had manna to eat. They would walk out in the front porch, and it's like there's some food on the ground. You just gathered it, and God would take care of them. But they'd been there for about two years, getting the Ten Commandments and all of that, and now God goes, now you're ready to go into the promised land. And what you're going to see today is God kim- comes up with this plan. He goes, I want you to take 12 people, 12 spies, and they're going to go into the promised land and scout out the land and then come back and give a report. So this is what the story is today. So if you look in Numbers chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, The Lord now said to Moses, send men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to Israel. Send one leader from each of the 12 tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He he sent out 12 men, all tribal leaders of Israel, uh, from their camp in the wilderness of Parim. So here's one thing. We're going to be talking about this a lot. But put the map back up just for a second, guys. Um, so in the map, I, I wish I could have showed you the other map, but basically where Kadesh Barnea is and then all the way up, that's the promised land. And in that, when the Israelites conquer it, they're going to divide the land up into the 12 tribes. Okay, So each tribe would get a section, a, a portion of land, except for, because if you've ever studied this, I remember studying this for the first time, I'm like, that doesn't add up. Like, So you got the 12 tribes. Do you know where the 12 tribes came from? There was a guy named, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. The youngest was Benjamin. You had Joseph and then Benjamin. So out of the 12 tribes, the Levites, Levi doesn't get any land. When they divided out the land, God's like, the Levites don't get anything. Why? Because they were like the priests. They were the people in ministry, which... That, that's what I am. I'm a little salty because I don't get any land. You know what I mean? It's like, like why can't I have some land? I just, want, I just want 10 acres out in the country. You know what I mean? But, but so when they divided out the land, the Levites didn't get, they, they weren't counted. And Joseph, he's not considered a tribe either because Joseph actually gets two. He's got, he's got two sons. And I'll give someone a thousand points if you know his two sons' name. Ephraim and... Manasseh. Yeah, Ephraim and Manasseh. So, so Joseph had two sons. And so God, instead of considering Joseph to have a tribe, he gave his son. So I guess, that's, I guess one of them took Levi's allotment of land or something, which I'd have been a little salty. So, uh, but anyway, so the, I will show you that map at a later date. But here's, so from the 12 tribes, they chose one person from each land. And they go, okay, you're going to go into the land and you're going to scout out the land and come back and tell us what it looks like. Let's jump down to verse 17. It says this, says, Moses gave the men these instructions. Now, now listen, I don't, I don't know if you're sleeping on me or not, but you got your Bible on your lap, and I want you to pay attention to details today, okay? These are important. These are important. This is going to come up. Moses gave these instructions, gave the men these instructions as he, as he sent them out to explore the land. He says, go north, northward uh, through the Negev into the hill country. Now, this is another piece of information. The hill country was like the woods, okay? So I'm getting ahead of myself, but when they divide out the land, after they conquer the land, Moses goes, uh, not Moses, but Joshua goes, you, you, they would divide out the land and this tribe would get to choose whatever portion of land they want. And the other tribe, that, and you know what everybody wanted? Everybody wanted the land that's closest to the river. Do you know Why? You know why they, why would you want, why would you want, if I was like, you can have any land that you want, uh, and you would say, I want the land by the, the well-watered uh, plains of the Jordan. Why? Because they were farmers, and they wanted to plant crops, and you had herd, you know, you had sheep and cattle, and you had to water them. And so what nobody wanted was a hill country. Mainly, there were giants in the hill country, and there was woods, and if, you know, Nowadays, if, you, if there's like a plot of land and it's all woods, we have big machines that will go in and just tear everything up really easy, right? But back then, they didn't have machines. So if you had like a plot of land and there's a bunch of timber on it and you wanted to clear that, well, that was like a lifetime job, right? So, so most people didn't want the hill country because it was hilly and there were trees and there were giants there. And most people wanted down by the water, okay, which 
Not me. I would have been like, give me some land. Give me, again, give me 10 acres up in the mountains. I'm good. I'm good. Um, but here, here's what it says. Um, verse, where did I stop? Verse 19. No, no, verse 18. So verse 18, it says, this, this is the instructions. Pay attention to the instructions. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? Do the towns have walls or are they unprotected? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Enter the land boldly and bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first, the first uh, ripe grapes. And then verse 21 says, so they went up and explored the land. And so this was... Look at me. You got to remember, this is just an exploration. This was just a, 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 an, an exploratory thing where they would go and just, just come back and tell us what you saw, okay? We don't need your opinion. Just come back and tell us and bring back samples of the fruit that you see. So here's in verse, 20, verse 23, it says, When they came to what is known as the Valley of Eskol, they cut down a cluster of grapes so large that it took two men to carry it on a pole between them. They also took samples of pomegranates and figs. Put this on the screen. This is a big cluster of grapes. This is probably what it looked like. Now, think about that. Like they go, this is a, I, I've told you this before, but the, for whatever reason, God called the land. It's a, it's a good land and it's flowing with milk and honey. It, in other words, it's just like, it, it's fertile. It's, you know, you can, these are the crops that you, um, when I think about it's a land flowing with milk and honey, if there's milk there, there's cows there. If there's cows there, there's cheeseburgers, right? That's how my mind works. Or there's steaks, like me, a good medium rare steak. But if there's milk, there's cows. If there's cows, there's food, right? There's hamburgers and cheeseburgers. And, and so it's, it's a good land. There's lots of animals there. There's lots of crops. And they go to the next slide. It might have looked like that or it might have looked like this, you know, big clusters of grapes. Or it might have looked like that. I don't know. All I know, listen, they were there for 40 days. The spies went in the land for 40 days, and they brought back a cluster of grapes. And I just know that if I was one of the guys carrying the grapes, as I'm walking along, I'm going to be plucking, right? I'm going to get back after 40 days ago. You should have seen the grapes they had. We had some, but they gone now. You know what I mean? Like, I, I couldn't control myself. I had. Um, anyways, so are you like that? Like, I, I know, like, if there's... If there's chocolate in the house, I'm going to eat it. If, like if I have in possession of any candy or anything, I just I don't have any control over that. Um, so look at, um, look at verse 25. It says, after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses and Aaron, uh, Moses, Aaron, and the people of, uh, of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Param. So I'm going to put this map up here. So the spies go in and they scout out the land. Okay, and they started it down south at Kadesh Barnea, and they went all the way up. You got the music, guys? Okay, there's supposed to be some spy music going on there. So, uh, so they started down here, and for 40 days, they went up all the way to Bethel, and then they came back down, right? And they were just scouting out the land. The land. They just were supposed to bring back samples just to tell the people, hey, listen, God told us that this is an awesome land flowing with milk and honey, and it is. That's all he wanted them to do. Look, at, it says they, uh, in verse 26, it says, they reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. Now, look at this. Look at the report they gave. We arrived in the land you sent us to see, and it is indeed a magnificent country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here are some, here are some of its fruits as proof. So they were going, God didn't lie, right? Which boggles my mind because God never lies. God has never told you a lie. He's never misled you. He's never led you down the wrong path. If God said it, you can bank on it, okay? But these people, for whatever reason, have a hard time trusting God. I don't know if you can relate to that or not. But verse 28, it says, so they, they gave this report. Remember what they said? They go, it indeed is a magnificent country. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And look at all the fruit that we brought back. And then they go, verse 28, but 
The people living there are powerful, and the cities and towns are fortified and very large. We also saw the descendants of Anak who, were, uh, who are living there. Do you know who the descendants of Anak are? The giants. They're the giants. So David and Goliath, right? There was, uh, if, if you got a pen, you're taking notes, write this down in your margin. Go to Genesis chapter 6. You can do your own study on this. But in Genesis 6, it talk, this is just before God flooded the whole world. And it says, and there's some controversy about what this actually means. But the Bible says that when the, the sons of men saw the daughters of man, they slept with some of them. And out of that union came what's called the Nephilites. And the Nephilites was a race of people that were, uh, they were giants, okay? And then there's some dispute about like what they actually were, but they, we know that they were giants. And the Bible says after that, it says that during that time before the flood, and, and it says, and sometime after, there were giants in the land. And we know that there were giants in the land later because David and Goliath happened years after the flood, years after this right here, hundreds of years later. And if you want to do an, an interesting study, I'm not like conspiracy theorists or anything like that, but uh, I say that all the time, so you probably think I am. But, um, but go look up what Kent Hovind on Kent Hovind and put in, go to YouTube and put in Kent Hovind on giants. He's got a whole, like lots of videos about all the giant skeletal bones that have been found through the years. Now, you don't hear much about them because it kind of flies in the face of evolution. Like they want you to believe that we started, that, that we started out as an amoeba and we're growing, getting better. But this is not true. There used to be giants on land. We're actually getting smaller, which is why you have to get your wisdom teeth. That's the whole thing. I don't have any good. But your wisdom teeth don't fit, but they probably used to. You know what I mean? So anyways, uh, there used to be giants in the land. And, um, and when I say giants, um, we'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to that. I want to go back and look at what they said. Remember verse 27, they said, uh, it's a magnificent country, okay? But then they go, but, in verse 28, but... So you know what happened is they had a big butt. They, they let their butt get in the way. You sometimes have a big butt, okay? We're going to talk about your big butt, and you need to get rid of it, okay? I'm not talking about physical. I'm just talking about, like, sometimes there are things in your life, and you go, I know I need to do this, but, and you psych yourself out, or you let other people psych you out, and you go, you, you know, you, you just let other factors come in, and instead of doing what you know you should do, you let your big butt get in the way. So they had this big butt, which was the opposite of faith. And, um, and then verse 30, if you jump down to verse 30, Caleb has a big butt too. Caleb, was, let me just back up. So out of the 12 spies, right, 12 spies, there were 10 guys, and then there were two guys, Joshua and Caleb. And the reason why you know Joshua and Caleb is because of this story right here, because Joshua and Caleb were the only two that had faith. And so look what it says in verse 31. It says, but the other men... Uh, no, I'm sorry, verse 30. It says, but Caleb tried to encourage the people as they stood before Moses. Let, let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. So you see what happened? There were 12 guys went out, 12 spies. They came back with fruit and they presented themselves to the community, this large group of people. And they go, let me tell you the amazing land we saw. Look at this fruit. It's amazing. And they go, but there's giants in the land. And they're huge, and we can't defeat them. And Joshua and Caleb are over here going, don't listen to these idiots. And he was like, shut your mouth. Like, God, you know, God didn't ask for your opinion about that. Seriously, like, they were mad. They were going, we can certainly conquer it. Why, you know, the, the, the others were trying to discourage the crowd, and they did that. But Joshua and Caleb said, we can conquer it. Look at verse 31. It says, but the other men who had explored the land with him, with him answered, we can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So if you're taking notes, I got two things that I want you to write down. The first one is this. The spies were not asked for their opinion. You could go back and look. I read it earlier. God said, send the men in to just scout out the land and come back and tell us what you saw. He never asked for their opinion. They were never asked for their opinion. They, they were instructed to just scout out the land and report what they saw. Can I just... Can I just tell you, can I, be, can I be the jerk to you right now? God doesn't need your opinion, okay? He doesn't. If he's telling you to do something, if he's asking you to do something, he don't really care what you think about it. He doesn't need your opinion. He doesn't need your input. 
You, because people go, well, but, but, but God, but God. God's telling me to do this, and God's like, you don't, think I fa- you don't think that I factored that in? You don't think I factored in your stupidity in the whole equation? You don't think that I've already thought through every scenario? Like, God is smarter than you. So in that moment when God tells you to do something, and you go, God, but God, you're going, I'm smarter than you, God. You don't know. God's like, I do know because I see the beginning from the end. He's infinite. He's all-knowing. There's nothing he doesn't know. So whatever scenario you're going through, whatever trail you're going down, he already knows what the end looks like. You don't. So you would do well to just trust him and to say, all right, God, if that's what you said, I'm going to do that. But why is it that we have a hard time and we, we go, but God, but God, he don't need your opinion. Okay? He's already thought about it. Number are, you, are we okay? Are you guys mad at me? Some, some of you guys are about to walk out. All right. Number two, the second thing is specific instructions are important to God. Okay? If you read the Bible like I have, and you should read the Bible, every year I read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I actually put it on my phone and I listen to it. But, but listen, in, especially in the Old Testament, especially in the law, you will find, like, like th- that's one of the things I came away with. When I read the Bible, I'm like, details are important to God. Like he cares about the small things. When you read in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, about the detail that God wanted to put in the tabernacle. Here's how you're supposed to do it. Here's all the gold you're supposed to, here are the rubies you put in there. Down to the smallest detail. God cares about details. And, and, and if you don't read the Bible, you're not going to get that. So you might be flipping about it and go, oh, I'll just do what I think is best. Okay? Let me tell you how that worked out for David. There was a story in the Old Testament where King David... There, were, there was um, the Ark of the Covenant, which is where the Ten Commandments were, the, Ar- the Ark of the Covenant. And they, it, would like, it was like overladen with gold and had these cherubims on the top. And it's supposed to be kept in the temple, in the, ta- the tabernacle in the Old Testament and then the temple. But it, one time they went into battle and it got captured by the enemy. Okay, And so David went to go get it. And David fought the enemy and won the battle. And he was like, I want to go get the Ark of the Covenant. And I want to bring it back to my palace. And I want to have it in my home. Okay, nothing wrong with that. So he goes to get it. And he takes a bunch of his men. And he goes, okay, we're going to put it on this cart. And the oxen's pulling the cart. And he goes, I want to put some men on each side of it. Because if this this thing starts to fall over, you you need to steady it as it goes along. So they was going. And the Bible says that the oxen stumbled. And the Ark of the Covenant started to tip over, and there was a man who reached up and grabbed it. Anybody for a thousand points, who knows this man's name? Nobody knows. Disappointment. No. What is it? What did you say, Caitlin? What would she say? Uzzah. Uzzah. His name's Uzzah. U-Z-Z-A-H. Okay? Anyways, it's going to be on the test when you get to heaven. But anyway, so, um, no, but listen. The, the cart's going along with the Ark of the Covenant in it, and the oxen stumbled, and it started to tip over. And so this man, who was a good man, trying to do the right thing, reached up and grabbed it so it didn't fall down and smash a bunch of pieces. And you know what God did to him? He killed him on the spot. And David's like, what the heck? Like, that's a paraphrase, but he was like, what the heck? You know what I mean? Like, he was like, God, why do you kill him? Do you know why God killed him? Because God, was, God had specific details about who was supposed to touch that Ark of the Covenant. And if anybody touched that, that, was, that wasn't part of the tribe of Levi, I think it was the Levites. If anybody touched that that wasn't part of the tribe of Levi, God was going to kill them instantly. Now, you might go, well, how was he supposed to know that? You know how? Because God wrote it down in the book. It was in the Old Testament. It was in the law. God, hundreds of years earlier, wrote it down and gave it to them. And it's David's fault for not knowing it. Okay? David was the king. He's expected to know the Bible. Okay? And he didn't know that. And now one of his best friends was dead. It's his fault. And you might go, well, that was harsh. God, why'd God do that? Because God wrote it down and he said, these details are important to me. You should familiarize with the book. This is not an ordinary book. This is a Bible that will change your life. And to the extent that so many Christians that I know never read the Bible, I'm like, well, you're going to get what you get. It's no wonder your life looks like the way that it does because you don't, you don't know the book or the person that wrote the book. Okay, I, I don't mean to yell at you guys. I'm just telling you, it's super important. Details are important. And so that story with Uzzah, 
It's like, that seems unfair. God don't care what your opinion is. He, he, it's fair to him. So he did that. And so there are other things that people go, well, I didn't know God felt like this. You know, that's, we go through a litany of things where, I, like, God already wrote it down in the book, okay? So if you would just familiarize your, yourself with this, you would save yourself a lot of heartache. And me too. Okay, so let's go on. So that was the story about Uzzah and, uh, and then verse 32. It says, so they, the ten, there were 12 spies. Ten of them, it says, spread discouraging reports about the land among the Israelites. You know, how many of you guys know that uh, complaining is contagious? You know that? Like, you ever been around a chronic complainer? You ever been around someone who, you, you know anybody that just sees the negative and everything? Stay away from people like that, okay? And if that's you, I'm probably going to stay away from you because I don't want to be around people like that. Like, it takes no faith to point out the obvious. Yes, there's giants in the land. Yes, the people are strong. But who cares? God didn't tell you to come back and bring your opinion. God said, come tell us what the land was like and bring back some food. That's all he said. He didn't ask for your opinion. And so you go, yeah, newsflash, giants are stronger than me. So what? But they're not stronger than God. Are they? Are giants stronger than God? No. So they came back and they discouraged the whole, uh, the whole crowd. And look at, look at what happened in verse 32 later. It says, the, the land we explored, this is what they said. They go, the land we explored will swallow up any who go to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. We felt like grasshoppers next to them, and that's what we looked like to them. Put, put, it, put that on the screen. So this is a scale. I don't, I don't know how accurate this is, but I know uh, the average man is not six foot. I'm five six. Okay? I feel like I'm No, I'm short. I know I'm short, but the average, the average Jewish man was not. The average Jewish man back then was probably like five foot three, honestly. But anyways, but uh, I looked this up, so I found this graphic, and I looked up Amos 2.9. I'll save you the trouble. And I went and looked at it, and it said, in Amos' day, it said the people at that time were as tall as cedars. He was talking about the giants. He goes, they were tall as cedars. I don't know how tall cedars are, evidently 36 feet, 24 to 36 feet. But, but they were huge, you know, and you go back and read the story of David and Goliath. When David fought Goliath, the Bible says he's about, depending on which interpretation you read, about nine and a half feet tall, almost 10 feet tall, okay? But so there were literal giants. Now, this is not fairy tale. There were literal giants living in, in the land. And um, so number three, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. And this is an important thing. The fear of man will paralyze you and prevent you from enjoying the promised land. Now, the reason why I said enjoying is because for the spiritual application, if you're in here and you're a Christian, okay, the promised land is a certainty for you. It's just, and in some ways, we're already in, enjoying that. But, but it's like, I know, I know that if I drop dead of a heart attack today, I'm, I'm ushered in the presence of Jesus, and I'm going to be, that's the promised land. That's what I'm looking forward to. But in there's, there's some ways in a spiritual realm, where a spiritual application, that I'm enjoying the promised land now. Like when I have peace in my life and joy, and God blesses me with, with material things. That's all enjoying the promised land. But what I want you to know is that if you're controlled by the fear of man, you're going to miss out on a lot of those things. Okay, there's going to be a lot of things that you don't get to do in life because you're scared to step out on faith because you're scared of people. And Jesus told us, don't fear man. He said, you need to fear God. Don't fear man. Don't, he goes, don't fear a person who can kill your body. He said, fear the, the God in heaven that can destroy both body and soul in hell. But he's like, there's no reason to fear man. And that's what they did. They were looking at, this gi at giants and they were going, how are we going to beat them? You know how? Because you're not going in your own strength. Yeah, if you were going in your own strength, if I was going to fight a giant in my own strength, I'm going to lose 10 out of 10 times. But if I go in the strength of God, then I'm going to win 10 out of 10 times. That's how it works. And there are some people who have faith, and some people just can't get past the fear of man. They just can't take their eyes off the giant. They're like, there's no way. Well, then you're going to miss out. I'm sorry. You don't have enough faith to trust God. Um, there they're, they're the two guys in there, and I'll talk about this later, but Joshua and Caleb, 
You could mock, people would mock them and ridicule them and go, oh, you think we can beat these giants? Yeah, you know why? Because they had faith of a child. You know, you know, a little child sometimes just looks and goes, you know, my dad can beat up anybody, you know, or whatever. And, and, and childlike faith just means, well, if God said that we're going to have victory, then we're going to have victory. You go, you go, well, your head is in the sand and you got, you're like a child. Yeah, that's what God says, childlike faith. You know, forget about what everyone else says because their opinions don't matter. If God said it, it's going to happen, right? And that's what Joshua and Caleb were. They had childlike faith, and they experienced the rewards of that. We're gonna, let's talk about this. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14, and we're going to go through this chapter. It says, Then all the people began weeping aloud, and they cried all night. Their voices rose in a great choir of complaint against Moses and Aaron, We wish we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they wailed. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and little ones will be carried off as slaves. Let's, it's so stupid. It's it's such a lack of faith. It's such a slap in the face to what God has said and what God has done. Did you not see the Red Sea? Did you not walk through on dry ground? Yes, you did. Did you not see the 10 plagues? Yes, you did. You witnessed it with your own eyes. Why do you have so little faith? Is what God says. Look, he says in verse um, verse 3, no, verse 4, um, verse 3, it says, Why is the Lord taking us out of this country to have us die in battle? Our wives and little ones will be carried off as slaves. They go, let's get out of here and return to Egypt. Really? That's your best plan? You want to go back? And, and yeah, we were slaves. And yeah, they used to beat us. And we had to work and break our back from morning till night. And we didn't get paid for it. But that's got to be better than this. Really? Why, why is it that people want to go back to their old lifestyle, their old life, after God has done so many miracles in their life? And it happens all the time. The Bible says it's like a dog returning to its vomit. You ever, you ever seen a dog return to its vomit? We, we used to have a dog. One time, one time we had a dog that threw up. It would puke in the kitchen. And I would leave it because I know later he was going to go clean it up himself. So just let, that's a little tip for you, you know. That's a hack. That's a life hack for you. Let them clean it up themselves. Anyways, um, but these guys are a bunch of whiners. They're like, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back to Egypt. Look at verse 5. Um, then Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground before the people of Israel. Uh, two of the men who explored the land, this is what I said earlier, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, they tore their clothing. They said to the community of, community of Israel, the land we explored is, is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into that land uh, and, and give it to us. You, you know what's happening here? Joshua and Caleb they knew that they, were, that they were on the verge of ticking God off. God was upset with the community of Israel, and he's about to do something. Look at what happened in verse 10. It says, But the whole community began to talk about stoning Joshua and Caleb. How crazy is that? They, they didn't want to hear it. They put their fingers in there like, no, we don't, we don't want to hear this. Can it, really quick, you know that the crowd is not always right. You know, oftentimes the majority of the people are wrong. Just look at America. You know what I mean? Like, you look at the way that America is going. They're, like, don't follow the crowd. Listen, I, I always talk to young people, but this is for everybody. Don't go on social media and, you know, this guy is smarter than me. He's a scientist or this person is a doctor, so they, they know better. No, no, I don't. I trust God and I trust the Bible, okay? And to the extent that anybody disagrees, I'm not going to listen to what they say. There are any number of people that want to lead you down the wrong path. And so don't go with the crowd, Don't always follow the crowd. Listen to what God says. If somebody is telling you that what God said in his word, because I'm just telling you, like there were 10 guys that got the whole community of Israel on their side. They're ready to stone Joshua and Caleb. And I don't care. I'm just telling you for me, because we live in a time where there's like a great apostasy. There are whole churches. There are pastors that are walking away from the faith. They're still in the pulpit. They still have church every Sunday, but they, they don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. They believe in all kinds of sins that, the, that this, this uh, society says is acceptable, that flies in the face of what the Bible says. And I'm like, I refuse to go along with it, okay? And I don't care if everyone in this room gets mad and walks out on me and says, I'm not following God anymore. All right, hope that works out for you. 
but I'm going to keep following God to the very end. Okay? And I know some of you guys will be there with me. But I know that there's a lot of people in, our, in today's society, in America, that are just like, I used to be a Christian. You, you go on social media, go on TikTok. There's any number of people that want to tell you about, here's why I walked away from the church. Well, I'm sorry you had a bad experience at church, but don't blame God for that. And just because you walked away from God, I'm not going to. Okay? You're never, you, nobody will never convince me that, that to walk away from God. That walking away from God is the right path to go. Never. It's never going to happen. So you just have to be resolute in what you believe. Because if it's open for debate, you know, you might entertain certain things. Joshua and Caleb, this, I'm just, I just want to tell you, I wrote this down. In a, in a world filled with faithless people, be a Joshua and a Caleb, okay? Be like them. Because it worked out for them, and it did not work out for the rest of you. The rest of the people went against God. And let's just see how that worked out for them. It says this. Um, it says in verse 9, they said, um, no, no, where, where am I at? Verse 10. Verse 10. It says, but the whole community began talking of stoning Joshua and Caleb. It, said, it says, then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared and all the people or all the Israelites it says, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites from above the tabernacle. You know what happened? Now they're in trouble. God just showed up. You ever, you ever had, uh, when you were a kid, you get in trouble, and your mom goes, you just wait till your dad gets home. You ever had that happen before? Yeah, because you, you knew. That was like the worst day, because you knew when your dad got home, your butt was going to get whooped. And, and so God shows up, and their butt's about to get whooped, because here's what it says. Um, verse 11, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? Will they never believe me, even after all the mir miraculous signs I have done among them? He says in verse 12, I will disown them and destroy them with a plague. Then I will make you into a, great, into a far greater and mightier uh, a nation, far greater and mightier than they are. So this is what God said to Moses. Moses goes, God, God goes, Moses, step out of the way because I'm about to destroy all these people and I'll start over with you and I'll make you into a great nation. That's what God was so ticked off with them. But thank goodness for Moses. Look in verse 13. It says, but what will the Egyptians think when they hear about it? Moses pleaded with the Lord. I'm so glad that Moses pled. And I talked about this before, how you and I should be pleading for our communities you, for our families. You should be interceding on behalf of your family. Verse 19 says, he says this, he goes, please pardon the sins of this people because of your mag magnificent, unfailing love, just as you have forgiven them since they left Egypt. He, he goes, he goes don't, don't forgive them because they deserve it. They don't. Forgive them because you are a, a magnificent God. Verse 20, and then I'm almost done. Verse 20 says, then the Lord said, I will pardon them as you... As you have requested, but surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will enter, the land, enter that land. They have seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I performed both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they tested me by refusing to listen. Now, I want to tell you what the, the consequences are. There were consequences to the people. Were they forgiven? Yes. God goes, I'm going to forgive them, but none of you guys get to go to the promised land. Look at what it says. Let's go on to verse 25. It says, now turn around. He, he says, now turn around and go on toward the land where the Amalekites and Canaanites, I'm sorry. He says, don't go. Now turn around and don't go on toward the land where the, Can the Amalekites and Canaanites live. Tomorrow you must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. What's that? That's the opposite direction. The promised land's over here. God, you said promised land. But he goes, no, no, not so fast. You had your chance. You don't get to go to the promised land. Turn your butts around and go back to the Red Sea where you're going to be in the, in the wilderness for 40 years. Look in verse 29. He said, you will all die here in the wilderness because you complained against me. None of you who are 20 years or older and were counted in the census will enter the land I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. 
Those are the only two. So God says, out of everybody, everyone 20 years and older, you don't get to go into the promised land. You guys are going to wander around the desert for 40. Look at verse um, 34. It says, because the, men ex- because the men who explored the land were there for 40 days, you must wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, suffering the consequences of your sins. You will discover what it's like to have me for an enemy. You don't want to discover what that's like. Nobody does. You don't want to. God God was on their side, and they said, no thanks, God. We can't do it. And God took offense to that, and he goes, now I'm not on your side. Now I'm against you. And all of the people who were adults had to wander in the wilderness, the desert, for 40 years. For the next 40 years, they had to stay out there and eat manna. You, you, guess what? Guess what you're having for breakfast tomorrow? Manna. Guess what you're having for lunch tomorrow? Manna. Guess what's di- for dinner tomorrow night? Manna. Hamburger helper or manna helper, whatever it is. But it's manna. That you be creative with it. But it's manna for the next 40, t- 40 years till you all die and then your children get to go into the promised land. And you might go, well, that sounds pretty harsh. No. I mean, not to God it's not. And his opinion is the only one that matters, right? Let me summarize the last of this, and then I want to, and then we'll close out. But let me just say, uh, if you look in verse 36 through 45, what happened was, at that point, God, God goes, present yourselves. And there were 12 spies. You got Joshua and Caleb, and I don't even know the names of the other guys because they're not important. But God killed all 10 of those guys. And then the very next thing in verse 39 through 45, the community of Israel, the whole crowd of people, they go, God just killed those 10 people. They go, hey, we changed our mind, God. We're going to go to the promised land right now. And Moses goes, it's too late. Don't go to the promised land. They go, no, we got this. We got. So they all gathered up, everybody. They went to the promised land. They go, we, we believe God now. And, and Moses is like, don't go. You're... It's not going to work out for you. Don't go. And they went anyways, and they lost the battle, and a bunch of them died, and everyone else came back with their tail between their legs, going up to Moses, going, what the heck? And Moses like, you missed your chance. Like, you had an opportunity, and you didn't take it because you disrespected God by saying no to that, and then you tried to go do it. You tried to force your way in there. They went in without God, okay? At first, they had God on their side, and now God was fighting against them. And they lost the battle. And so number four, if you're taking notes, I just, I just want you to write this down, is that timing is important. Listen to me. God is not to be played with. I, can, can I just be honest with you? I, f- I feel like there's too many people. There's too many Christians that just go, eh, God's not really serious. No, God is dead serious. He's not, God is not playing games. I think people play games with God. And I don't know why they think it's okay. And, and, and the people, you know, they... I always tell them, you get what you get. You, you put very little into your Christian faith, and this is what you get out of it. And you wonder why, you know, why are they getting so many blessings? Why does this person have peace in their life? Why is this happening for them? And I don't ever, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you look at the effort that you put into it, okay? And I'm just telling you, there are so many themes to this. This is a phenomenal story, and it's about faith, and it's about obedience. It's about complaining, It's about listening to doubters and negativity, letting those people surround your life and and buying into what they're selling. No, no, forget all of that stuff. What you need to do is you need to find out what God says in his word. And you might go, well, I'm praying about this and I don't know what God wants me to do. Listen, go back and read the Bible, familiarize yourself with this, because if you're not willing to be obedient to what he's already said, he's probably not going to share more with you. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Like, be obedient to what you know. That's the first step. And then the next step might just fall into place. But negativity, conquering giants, everyone in this room faces giants in a spiritual sense. We all, we all do. Everyone does. And you got to look at that and go, yeah, in my own strength and in my own power, I'm not strong enough to overcome this addiction. I'm not strong enough to overcome this anxiety and depression that I'm... But, but with the power of God, there is nothing that stands in my way that I can't defeat. Nothing. So I just, I don't know what God is saying to you today. So let's all just bow our heads. And I want to close this out in a time of invitation. And uh, go, go ahead and stand to your feet with your heads bowed and eyes closed. And I, I'm just, I don't know. I don't know what God is saying to you. But 
I want to tell you, stop playing games with God. Stop pretending that the details, that the small things in your life don't matter, that God doesn't care if you sleep around, that God doesn't care what comes out of your mouth, that, that God's, God's cool with how these little compromises in your life. He's not. God is holy and he's righteous and he demands that we follow him in complete obedience. We, we got to quit playing games with God. You got to quit following the crowd. I, I don't know how you feel about that, but there, this world does not have my best interest at heart. You, you, if, if you follow what the trends are and what, you know, po- what is popular in culture today, you, you know, God is always going in the opposite direction of culture. So if, if you fit in with the crowd, you're probably not following God. And it sucks. It, it does. It sucks sometimes that we, that we get mocked and ridiculed at your job and kids go to school and get made fun of for being a Christian. But that's okay. It's okay because God wins in the end. Everyone that's in this room, if you're on God's team, the battle has already been won. You're on the winning side. You just got to hang in there and trust God every step of the way. Don't follow the crowd. The crowd's wrong. They're going in the wrong direction. They're not going in God's direction. You don't need them. So that means if you stand alone, if it's just you and Joshua and Caleb, that's all right. You're in the majority. So whatever God's telling you, today, I, I'm going to open it up. We got a few people down front that will pray with you. I, I, f- I feel like we play too many games at church. I, I feel like... I feel like there's a heaviness in, in the room right now. There was in the first service too. And, and there's some people in this room going through some stuff. And you, you're just like, I'm just going to put on my big boy pants and tough it out. Well, that's not really biblical. Um, if you can't be real in this church, I don't know where you can be. If you're going through something right now or your family's going through a, a crisis, a situation, you come, come down and pray at the altar. Come pray with somebody. Carrying these burdens all by yourself is, is part of the reason why you stay disconnected and depressed all the time and discouraged all the time. You need to surround yourself with people who are uplifting, people who believe the best in you. I, just, I, don't, I don't know. Why, I just feel like we're playing games with God. We come to church and pretend like everything's okay, and it's not. If your marriage is falling apart, if you're struggling with an addiction, if you're battling the fear of man and anxiety, it's time to get real with God, and it's time to get honest about what's going on. We're going to spend some, time, some more time in this invitation if God's dealing with you about something. You need to do business with God. Some things you need to give over to God. Start trusting him for some things. Just an attitude of prayer, and if if you're playing games with God, and you don't know Him personally, that's like the worst thing. I mean, God has so many great things in store for you, but you can't access any of them until you give your life to Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, what I'm going to ask you to do is after the service, or even right now, step out from where you're at and go back. 
uh, to the next step. Pastor Chuck's back there. Pastor Chad is back there. And we want to sit down with you and walk you through, make sure you understand what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. We, w- we want you to know what it means to be born again and forgiven of all of your sins. And so don't put it off. Don't quit playing games with God because you, you don't know what tomorrow holds. So let's pray together as we get ready and close out. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your word. God, I apologize when, we, when I feel like we're not taking you as seriously as you deserve because you've given us your word. You've given us the Bible to show us how to live. And it's sad that we don't get into that, that we don't learn it. And so, God, we want to put you at the forefront of our lives. We want to put you on the throne because that's where you deserve to be. We want to remove ourselves from that place. And, and we know that when we do that, you'll go ahead of us and you'll fight our battles for us. We do not, cannot go into battle in our own power and strength, God. We need you. This church needs you. And God, I just, I want to pray for our church. We need revival. It's just too, many, too, too much going through the motions. The church in America needs revival. Our country needs revival. And sometimes my heart needs revival, God. So start with me. Start with this church. I pray that you do a work in our lives this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone have a great day. Uh, don't forget, 5 o'clock, if, you're, if you want, we're going to be playing softball out on the field. God bless you.